today. Maybe that's um, because I put small group work in our agenda that tends to scare off people occasionally. Um, we may or may not use the small group function. Um, that'll depend on sort of where our conversation goes today and also how many of you are here because it doesn't make sense to break off unless we have enough to have groups of two or three and make that time productive. Um, my goal in using that kind of technique just so that you all know is to help break up the meetings and also provide for space for more active conversation among you all and also to move work along a little more quickly. Um, so if you are here, you are at the CCDF Consolidated Housing Plan Working Group, uh, state housing plan that is. Um, this is, I believe, our third meeting. Um, I think I've seen all of your faces at at least one of our two um, prior meetings. So thank you for coming back. Um, so I wanted to orient you a little bit to where we've been before I start my slides and move our meeting along. Um, we started our discussions at our first meeting um, with a presentation from the Department of Housing about what the state, state consolidated plan is. We heard about how it is a document that's required by the federal government to uh, clearly show how Connecticut plans to spend several uh, federal housing funding streams if you will, um, and that the state produces that after every five years um, after a process of gathering input through a variety of sources over the course of a year or two. Um, and so that conversation continued into our second meeting um, where we also identified some areas of possible focus, thanks to all of you doing some work in between the meetings. I shared those sort of five groupings that I found and all the comments you sent me for areas of focus within the consolidated plan. And through our continued discussion with the Department of Housing at that second meeting, we also learned about the state long range housing plan um, and what that was um, and what that document um, existed to do. And so we started having a little more conversation about that document at our last meeting and whether uh, something like that is perhaps a more appropriate vehicle for some of the recommendations that we had been discussing or whether it made sense uh, to continue with the consolidated plan or some combination thereof. So uh, for purposes of today's meeting, we're gonna start by continuing the conversation about the state long range housing plan. You should have received the link to that after the last meeting um, and as well uh, as incorporated in the email where you received the link to this meeting. So it's my hope that you did the homework that we assigned last time and you took the time to look at that plan and look through what it included. Um, we'll be spending a little bit more time today, hopefully talking about that. And it was my hope that, um, and my understanding that we would have uh, someone from the Department of Housing here today to answer questions, although I don't see um, Mike here on the screen yet. So maybe I'm looking to see if Will or Ashley could, I know Randy's out, uh, Randy Pincus, but could um, just check in with Mike Santoro quickly, make sure he received the link to the meeting today. Um, and we'll get moving in the interim with introductions and some initial conversation. Thanks so much, Ashley. Okay, so with that, I'll do what I usually do, which is use some slides just to orient us to our agenda and move us through the conversation. I would also want to note before we get started that um, we it's our goal to produce recommendations by the end of this calendar year, and it's my hope that we will be in a place perhaps in September, October, where we're starting to review some recommendations um, in writing, some draft recommendations, so we can uh, talk more about our July meeting um, and what might be teed up next as we get through our conversation today. So with that, I'm going to screen share my slides for you. And hope that you can all see them. All right, can you all see them? Just a thumbs up if you got it. All right, good. So this is our working group session. Let's see if I can advance my slides or if they're gonna be, there we go. So our agenda today is just a brief check-in. And then as I mentioned, have a continued conversation about the state long range housing plan, which I'm affectionately calling SLURP because that's the acronym that seems to make the most sense. <laughs> Uh, and then three is potential review of the proposed focus areas we went over last time. So we'll see where we end up with our long range housing plan discussion. If we decide that we'd like to go back to looking at those focus areas for the con plan, um, then my intention was to break you out into some small groups or perhaps depending on the size of the group, continue at large, trying to identify some 
what some specific recommendations in those five buckets might look like. And I'll spend some time uh, re-reviewing what those focus areas were with each of you. Uh, five is to just talk about any next steps or homework that we may have. Um, and then finally, to talk about our next meeting date and our upcoming schedule. Uh, as we've discussed in the past, meeting participation norms, please keep your camera on as, as in keeping with your comfort and ability. Uh, please use the hand raise feature when possible if you'd like to speak so I can try to sequence folks and make sure everybody gets a chance to speak. Um, please pay attention to your volume, move up your voice and listening. Um, if you're someone that's been quiet for a while, feel free to jump in. If you're someone that's shared a lot already in the meeting, please sit back a while so we can hear from others. And then finally, I will do my best to respect our time. We have 90 minutes today. Um, I would ask you to do the same as we engage in conversation. So our introductions for today, um, we'll just ask again, since there's some folks who weren't at the last meeting um, and we've had a, a mix of different people within the group at each one of these, just the name and the hat you're wearing at this meeting. So if it's a professional affiliation that brings you to this table, note that. If it's a volunteer or personal interest, note that. And then one brief thing you learned while reviewing the state long range housing plan in between our last meeting and this one. And we'll do this uh, popcorn style as it were to try to keep things moving along. So um, with that, I'm gonna stop sharing so you can see everyone's face. So once you state your name and one thing that you learned from reading the plan, just pick another name on the screen and that person will, will jump in. I'm gonna start with Matt Pafford because you're in the top left corner of my screen, Matt. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Matt Pafford, uh, I am with Connecticut OPM. Um, uh, I do, before I, I get into the state long range planning, I, I do want to say that uh, I will be leaving OPM at the end of the month and there will be a replacement at some point, but I don't know. I know we have another OPM rep on the phone, but I don't know if um, there's going to be anybody who replaces me long term at this point. Um, so I do want to say, though, it's been a pleasure working with all of you. I may end up back around here. I'm headed over to DAS, so I may end up back in this group from the DAS perspective of things, but I don't know at this point. Um, so with that, with that being said, uh, what I learned with learning, uh, reading through the state long range plan, and I didn't get through all 350 or so pages of it, um, is that it, like many other plans in Connecticut, say all the right things from a very high level, but in my opinion, provide very little detail that can be actionable. Um, and what I mean by that is they all say things like, you know, transit oriented development and responsible growth and all these buzzwords but they don't actually prescribe how we're going to get there. Um, and I think that is sorely lacking, not only in this plan, but in virtually every plan created by any state agency, including my own. So uh, next we're gonna jump to Margarita. You're next on my screen. Hi, I'm Margarita Albin, uh, Chair of the Planning and Zoning Commission in Greenwich. Uh, I'm gonna build on what, on what Matt just said and congratulations on whatever your new position is. Uh, I was very impressed by that high level view and how so how it's really comprehensive and all the things that are considered and then it, it just isn't it isn't single faceted because I hadn't had that expectation but yeah I see what you're saying how do how do we really get there and that's the question we ask ourselves all the time and we haven't made if you look at statewide numbers we just haven't made the progress any uh, some areas fairfield county has moved forward to some extent but a lot of the state hasn't and and how what's the the finite things that we just need to do um great points hey margarita who's next oh sorry um william cromwell housing committee clerk uh, yeah i'm the housing committee clerk i help out on all of these uh, commission working groups. Uh, I have looked over the, uh, I've not read the full plan, but I've looked over it and I've learned just the general outline of it, of the fact that it's largely a application to the federal government, which I found to be a new, a unexpected thing for me. I thought it was going to be a more, to have less of these smaller details, but yeah. Thanks. Uh, and I'll call on Zani next. Zani, are you there? 
Uh, I am. I am here. And uh, so I'm new. I'm just going to be temporarily filling in. So I didn't do any of the homework. I, I didn't actually uh, realize, but I'm happy to introduce myself. And uh, I look forward to the homework for next time. Uh, I feel like the unprepared student for this class, but uh, happy to meet everyone and happy to, to jump on board. You're so, just the new kid. This I'm the new kid, and I'm also temporarily going to be on the working group until a permanent person uh, gets on. And yeah, and I'll, I will drop my contact info to somebody who can send it around just in case there's questions in the meantime. But Jeremiah, it's nice to meet everyone. And it's good to get how this uh, the flow works as well. So thank you. Who's next for you? Pick someone else. Oh, okay. Um, Robert. Thank you. Hello. I'm Robert Boris. I'm on the uh, Groton Economic Development Commission and uh, very uh, glad to read through the report and just to, you know, uh, mirror what's been said so far. It's, it's great, but a little thin on the details of implementation and you know, that's where the devil in the details are. So I'm, I'm really interested in hearing the conversation on how we get to some of the uh, projections there. Thank you very much. And uh, Marcia. Hi, I'm Marcia. I'm, I live in Oxford. I'm, I'm basically a volunteer with um, a group that's interested in, in housing and making it more equitable. Um, I'm going to admit that I totally missed seeing the link to um, this very long document, but I'll get on it. Um, Thanks, Marcia. Don't really have much else to add, sorry. All right, and who would you like to go next? Um, Kirk. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, I'm, I, I was, I'm Kirk Carm from Ridgefield, Connecticut, a uh, private citizen, editor and publisher of a little website called uh, Ridgefield Record. Um, but I guess I was suppressed by the top down, uh, which I see sort of inhabits all of these kinds of discussions, whether it's from the federal government, the state, the state to the towns, um, sometimes tends to overstate the quote crisis, which I don't see a crisis. Um, and um, tends to be somewhat arbitrary um, and capricious. Um, uh, I guess the, and, and I guess the thing, the reality is that a lot of this is being done to satisfy some mandate from above. Um, instead of looking from the bottom up and saying, where are the problems and how do we solve the problems where they exist rather than create problems through Say's law, where supply creates its own demand. Uh, we should be trying to reduce poverty every place and provide enough housing where there is poverty to reduce the harm uh, from a lack of housing. So anyway, that's my, uh, that's my position. I'm sticking to it. And my, my new best friend I'd like to, to uh, put up next is Anika. <laughs> Thanks, Kirk. Anika Singh-Lamar. I teach the Community and Economic Development Clinic at the Yale Law School, also the Housing Clinic, and also another, anyway, I teach things to law students. Um, I learned more from Kirk's comment. I think I've read this plan. It's back from 2010. I read it back in 2010. Um, uh, it doesn't do any of the things Kirk just said, so I will say it's not top down. It says it's going to encourage local efforts to do X, for example. It says it's going to spend state dollars to do Y. There's literally nothing top down about it. Um, it doesn't project problems. It says over a third of homeowners and almost half of renters in Connecticut are cost burdened. That's a fucking problem. That's, a, that's a literally a problem. Those people's lives are harder because housing is too expensive. Um, I, the, and then the fact that you said you were just, that, that you're, that's your story and you're sticking to it, or what did you say? You, we can't change your mind about anything. Um, you don't wanna learn things. That's nice. I mean, I've, I've gathered that from your one-on-one -on -one email correspondence with me where I've tried to point you in the direction of resources and you've basically just said, no, I don't feel like learning anything. Um, there's a problem. Uh, it's described in some detail in this plan. Um, the plan limits itself to the solutions that the state has available to it. So the state can spend money, but not a lot of money. 
and the state can encourage towns to do things, but this plan doesn't assume that the state can tell the towns to do anything, which of course is not true, they can, it can, um, but there are some political assumptions embedded in here about what's really possible. Um, the primary thing I'd point out is that the plan doesn't uh, define success, right? So as I mentioned earlier, it does say that um, over a third of homeowners and almost half of renters are cost burdened. I believe, and Kylie will correct me if I'm wrong, those numbers have gotten worse since then, that those numbers are higher now than they were yes. 12 years correct. ago. Yeah, and nothing in here says we will feel like we did our jobs when those numbers decrease by Y. There's just nothing in here that says we'll, we, what success is. And as a result, not, I mean, not as a result, as a result of very limited tools and not even thinking about what success would be, we haven't made any progress on this stuff. Um, in fact, the needles moved in the opposite direction. So that's what I've learned. Um, I would encourage you all to not stick to your stories um, <laughs> and try to learn something as you go through this process. I can't tell you with a 20 year long career in housing policy, how many times I've learned things that I did not necessarily know were true before, but um, the research evolves. The, I read new things that I hadn't read before. I talk to people who I haven't talked to before. So I know there's a housing affordability crisis because I've talked to people who are experiencing it. I gather in Ridgefield, maybe Kirk, you haven't had that. Um, you haven't had that opportunity, but um, I would encourage you to, to maybe lead your bubbles uh, a little bit. And I will turn it over to Will. Thanks, Anika. Uh, Will Viederman, I run policy for Elm City Communities, the Housing Authority of New Haven. Um, I think Anika said a lot of what I would say, but uh, the thing that was most striking to me about this report was the sheer amount of data in it, um, which I think is unusual for compared to some other reports I've seen. The, the attempt to encompass an immense amount of data, um, and I think right the, the paucity of solutions that match the sheer scale of the data, um, I can't help but put it in context of the 830J uh, affordable housing plan um, lack of action from a lot of the state. And so uh, I hope that we can find a way to do some more. Thanks, Will. Uh, I think Rep Williams and Ashley are left to go if I'm not missing anybody else. You. I'm going to speak quickly. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. All right. Now I'm traveling on the Amtrak right now, so the signal is not responding. But I am Representative uh, Q Williams from the other district and Housing Chair. Um, and I'm, to, I'm already excited about this dynamic conversation. But I think from the plan, there's two things that really stuck out. Our director will cover more than two. One, uh, as it's focused in 2009, a lot of the issues that were going on in 2009 are still going on today. Um, and the fact that we haven't had uh, the much fixes towards is um, an issue. And one that I'm glad that we can all work on together. And I think that was a second that was fair as well. Um, so it was one thing. I think, two, even at the, as they, the earlier parts in the plan, uh, I didn't use the word but, but it was something to the effect of but, where they talked about we have a, uh, this is really important, but there's a finite um, source of, of, of resources. And I've always learned that whenever someone says the word but, ignore everything that was at the beginning, they pay attention to everything that was said after the word but. And it was the issue around the finite resources is for the accurate, but I think it goes back to the overall willpower that we are um, that this plan begins to move to. So I'm um, looking forward to us uh, figuring out how do we work around um, the real power to go and allocate the much needed resources that, yes, while finite, are needed if you're going to um, attack issues that they address around um, this fair housing and you know, eliminate this, this discrimination in our housing policy. Right. Thanks, Rep. Williams. Appreciate it. Travel safe. Uh, Ashley. Hi, everyone. Great work from me. I'm Ashley Ford. I am policy counsel, not the majority of meetings, so it's slightly different role. I'm a legal counsel before. I'm still going to be here on the meetings with you guys um, in the background. 
Thanks. Thanks, Ashley. Well, we're still waiting for Mike to join us. I'll um, quickly introduce myself and then we can chat a little bit more about the um, state long range plan. My name is Kylie Goslin. I'm the executive director of the Partnership for Strong Communities here in Connecticut and I've spent um, pretty much all my career in the housing and homelessness space. Um, the thing I was struck by, many of you brought up a lot of the things I saw. I was surprised by the level of detail and the amount of detail. It was a thorough report, um, especially in 2010, given what I know about what data is available. And that was a good thing to see that all in one place. Um, and I think um, the report did um, um, a decent job of showing how great the shortage is, tying the, uh, the value of housing to Connecticut economic growth. Um, and a variety of other factors. Um, I, I too noted there wasn't as much actionable, um, you know, or action items if, if you were. Um, and I walked away with some other questions such as, you know, were the objectives and measurements provided in the report ever assessed or evaluated? Um, but the biggest question I had really coming away from this is why, why we stopped producing this report and whether it's an opportunity to, you know, among the com the conversation that we've been having, whether um, whether this is a better type of vehicle for some of the policy, the broader, higher level policy planning and housing housing planning that we've been talking about, um, than something like the consolidated plan. And I asked that question um, twofold: one, because I think we kind of need to make a decision as a group whether we are going to continue to move along the track of providing recommendations for the CON plan, which again is tied more specifically to these federal housing streams, but could be expanded to, um, we could make recommendations that it should be expanded to include broader um, goals for the state or encompass other state housing funding streams, um, or whether something like this state long range housing plan would be a benefit, whether we go back to doing something like the state used to do, which apparently was produce both of these documents side by side every five years. And that way the state funding streams had a sort of a direction, if you will, with this plan or some guidance um, as to how they should be administered alongside the con plan. Um, and so I wanted to sort of share that question with all of you. I had a list of questions for Mike and for the Department of Housing, which we can um, get to if he's able to join us. But I, I wanted to kind of start there and ask you all what you think makes more sense um, as we've been tasked with really providing recommendations for this con plan. But again, the recommendations you provided to me for how we might proceed with, with areas of focus for the con plan, would they be better suited for reviving something like this, perhaps with more actionable items in it? So I'll pause there and ask for thoughts on that topic. Well, I guess I just I don't I don't know that I have an answer here, but I guess I'll just point out some pros and cons. So, yeah, uh, a pro of doing it to the con plan is that the state has to do the con plan; like they can't decide not to do it. So, if you change the way the state does the con plan, um, you know they have to submit the con plan to HUD. So, um, the con. I mean, I take Mike Santoro. I think in his initial meeting with us said, you know, don't mess with this thing that HUD tells us how we have to do it. And I also take that to heart, right? Like they've got to follow a whole bunch of federal rules um, in terms of how to do the um, con plan. Um, anything we add might be in tension with or might detract from those other obligations. So yep. maybe we don't want to mess with another thing that already has like a rubric. Um, yeah. yeah, I think... Um... Sorry, uh, Kylie, can I jump in? Oh, yeah, please feel free. I'm, I'm trying, I'm just taking notes so you can all sort of see as we go along what's been captured, which I think helps. Great. Um, yeah, I, 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 without being able to speak to the uh, administrative burden that any of this would put on, and, and I uh, sort of, I know that, right, for what Anika said, Mike, um, I think had some resistance just based on what they actually have to go through. A question that I had about about the con plan that feels maybe relevant or an argument for, for doing them in concert is ensuring that whatever it is that the con plan says is going to spend the money on works very closely in concert with um, 
the goals of a longer range housing plan. So whatever that, however that money is spent, um, it seems to me to be important to ensure that it's aligned with state funding or any other recommendations in a, in a longer range housing plan. Um, also, just so all of you know, I have tasked my colleague, who some of you know, Kaylee Pratt, with joining us to help with the group so she can help me do things like this while I'm um, facilitating because it's hard to do both. So bear with me today. So um, you see, I just accidentally created um, lines in my document. Um, so Kaylee will be joining us uh, next meeting to help with um, some of that and also helping to record and perhaps to prepare some uh, final recommendations with all of us. But um, well, I agree with you. One of the questions that came up for me too with, that, with respect to that topic was whether, um, for example, the qualified allocation plan for LIHTC, which is another sort of state policy document that the state produces, also should be aligned with this. And I think that's sort of gets to this larger issue um, and in thinking about the interwovenness of of not only the state produced plans, but also the affordable housing town municipal level plans, right? And I think what, what struck me as I was reading through this is thinking, you know, wow, there used to be this state document, which at least laid out sort of the lay of the land, as it were, around housing and home ownership and demographics um, and provided some 30,000 foot sort of guidance on where the state needed to go in terms of producing housing. Um, but question how integrated that is, as you know, with the con plan or with something like the qualified allocation plan, which has really specific guidance about where we're spending a huge glut of federal dollars that we get for LIHTC and that whatever we produce or whatever recommendations this group makes, um, one of those that, that seems like a priority to me would be assuring that there's responsiveness and alignment between those documents. In other words, it doesn't make sense to have a document that says, hey, we should produce all our housing in cities because that's what makes sense because that's where lower income folks tend to live versus the qualified allocation plan, which is really specifically um, moving towards um, assigning points based on this opportunity mapping concept. So those two things would kind of conflict. And so um, as we, again, pursue this path and consider recommendations, I, I hope that one of one of the things we can do is help to try to suggest that these things be knitted together in a way that makes sense and that is consistent, especially if they're five-year um, plans. Does anybody else have um, hands up or have any other thoughts on this as we're moving along? And now I erased all my notes. So I'm going to go back to, <laughs> I'm going to close out my whiteboard and go back to writing my notes on my um, sheet and I'll share them with you as we um, when, after we've wrapped up the meeting and the follow-up email. Um, anybody else have thoughts or questions on this? If I may, for, first of please, all, please. I, I did not intend to suggest that my mind is closed when I said I'm sticking to it, but um, I would agree um, with Professor Lamar that um, uh, trying to measure, trying to figure out what we're trying to accomplish here and lowering the cost burden would certainly be a good objective, the percentage of, of cost burden households. Um, and I think if the research I've done uh, suggests that producing more low income restricted housing does not lower the uh, cost burden housing. If you look at, if you try to you know, look at two side by side, they're fairly highly correlated that the more low income housing there is, the higher the cost burden, not the lower the cost burden. So, I, and I think the other thing we need to balance this with is that home values still remain, for many families, their single biggest asset. So we're certainly not suggesting that we want to sacrifice property values um, for lowering cost burden. Uh, the best way, to, of course, to do that is to increase prosperity faster than inflation. And currently, inflation and uh, interest rates are going to exacerbate uh, cost burden of home ownership or, or renting even. I mean, uh, rental, rental prices are going to go up with inflation. So we have a real challenge to try to figure out an economic solution because this is really an economic problem. 
and um, trying to force low income restricted housing in places where there isn't a great deal of poverty doesn't seem to me to make a lot of sense and it doesn't seem to solve that problem that we're talking about, which is cost burden. So if we stay focused on the problem and have a metric that we can, it's not just simply, you know, we haven't increased the number of low income restricted housing units in all 169 uh, towns, I think we could make some progress. And I think there's some things that we could agree on. We don't have to, you know, everything doesn't have to be uh, disagreement. I think we agree probably on more things than we disagree. The, the question is how do we, how do we resolve the problem that of, of cost burden uh, across the board? So uh, that's my thought anyway. Thanks, Kirk. I want to jump in before I go to Anika and just note that um, while um, I, I respectfully disagree and the facts show that I think the number of cost burden households, which we know to be well over 200,000 at this point in the state, um, deed restricted housing does lower their, their housing costs. Um, and we need more of it in order to meet the need. We also need more multifamily housing period, but we know all of that from the research and the data and the analytics that Mika and myself and others spend all our days looking at for better or worse. Um, but I just wanna to note too that um, Kirk, while I think um, the conversation around housing policy broadly is one that I would gladly sit and have with many of you, the conversation that this group really needs to have is how we wanna progress in making recommendations. I think the kind of conversation you're having about where we should be developing affordable housing and for who um, is really something that um, as we're talking about what, uh, whether it's a state long range housing plan or a consolidated plan should be part of a broader state process that brings in partners and, and the state would be overseeing that plan and putting those goals in place. So it's not really our job as um, an organ as a subcommittee of the state um, development group to make specific recommendations about where housing is developed. It's our job to make recommendations about how the consolidated plan might be improved upon or whether, as we've discussed here, there's a more appropriate sort of guiding policy document that the state should be um, producing. So it's not to say that we can't have conversations about housing policy here, just noting that what we're really trying to do is help the state figure out what should be included and what the vehicle may be for that. Anika? Yeah, so Kylie essentially said what I was planning to say, which is uh, most of what you just said, Kirk, has nothing to do with why we're here. Um, also, most of it was wrong. But I do want to thank you um, for providing really just like front and center um, evidence and an example of why it's not a good idea to make large swaths of public policy based on the opinions of the people who decide to show up to meetings and take up a lot of space. So appreciate that. All right. Any other thoughts about some of you have been quiet about um, the just, state if, long range if, plan? Yeah, if Mark. you could just repeat Kylie's point, maybe um, maybe Anika wouldn't mind just saying it again because I, I got a little lost on that. So you're saying our focus should be on deepening the strategy that's in there. That's the part I missed. So our, our task, as we um, shared in the first meeting, is to make, it's, it's broad. In two months, sorry. <laughs> that's okay, to make recommendations to the state around the consoli the state consolidated housing plan. The state right. consolidated housing plan is simply a plan that the state is required to produce by the federal government that says, hey, federal government, this is how we're going to spend these four or five different um, federal funding streams that you're giving us, and here's the direction that we think we need to be spending them based on the demographics and metrics and other things that are included in that report. A lot of what's in that report or what is required to be in that report is prescribed by HUD, as we've shared. So it's the job of this group to decide, hey, are there other things that you think that consolidated plan should include? And that's the proposed focus areas that we went through last time and I'll revisit with you again. Um, or as we discovered, there's this state long range plan that now is no, is, a, is a dormant thing and we haven't gotten into why, why that is, but is there, a, as we've looked at the consolidated plan and said, hey, should that include more needs assessment? Should that include better backwards looking evaluation processes? Those are some of the highlighted. 
do those things belong in that state consolidated plan? Or is that something that the state should be putting together sort of as a separate thing? That's the conversation we're having yeah. here. Um, so no, the reason, and I got a little lost just because I've okay. been so, so immersed in the development of our own plan that my brain had to go back to, okay. So um, I suppose my town is different from Ridgefield. Y'all probably know we have 30% roughly cost burden households. We know it's a we know it's a challenge. I would say to you that the deepest and greatest challenge is at the lowest income mm-hmm. because it is the hardest to get financing for. Okay. What, we do have a gap and I, I did a whole lot of data crunching for the plan on my own. We didn't hire a consultant. Mm-hmm. We we do have obviously a need in what Sarah Bronin always calls the missing middle. But my sense is that that's easier to finance and easier to build because you might be at 80% of area median income, at 80% of SMI. You've got, you've got rents that are higher and projects that are more viable for, the, for developers. Where you really run into a huge challenge is for the folks that are at 25 and 40% of state median income. And then there's nobody that's going to give you money and nobody's then it's going to help you. And you're, you, you, Anika, Anika's nodding. There's, it's just dry. I, I think we could make headway on the other pieces. And folks in my town didn't understand why I was talking about the missing middle. But those people are also housing cost burdened. And we have to think about them because they're, they're, many of them are young. So we do have to think about them, but the, the intractable, the tough, tough problem is funding for, and to be honest, getting better living conditions for people. We, we kept trying to count something called our naturally occurring affordable housing, NOAA, and it's very hard to count because the units don't show up. Why do they not show up? We know we have almost, I think it's 28% of our population believes is what well, is either Alice or below the poverty line. And yet those units they live in don't show up. Why? Because a lot of them are illegal. So we know there's people in bad living conditions. We can't find where they are because the units are illegal. How do we build options for them? And I'm sorry, Mr. Carr, I, I suppose that my town's just a lot more diverse because of where we're located, but we do have this group of, lo- we have low income and we need to address it somehow. And we know that. So that's what I would like to see the state, uh, us get to on the state focus is how do we get help for the people who are the most disadvantaged? Yeah. Um, I don't know how you do that. I'm not a housing policy expert for 20 years. I'm a poor little zoning person. Um, But it's just how do we do that? And that's why I wanted to be on this group. And that's what I was hoping you guys were saying is how do we get there? And yes, you know, we all have pushback from our community, but I don't want people to live in bad conditions. So that's my question to you guys. How do we put that into the plan where we're addressing the neediest part of the of the state? And then my question then to those of you who know, I guess it's the OPM folks, exactly where in the state is our deepest need? Is, is my town a deepest need? I would tell you we have a deep need, but I'm sure New Haven would jump up right away and say, get out of the way, Alban. I need it more. I don't know. Yeah. So I I leave Um, you with my questions. I'm sorry I'm not offering you answers, but that's what I was left struggling with after we worked on the plan. Well, yeah, and I think um, one of the things that came out of the initial review of the plan was incorporating needs assessment. And for those of you, there's been several needs assessments done in recent years. And for those of you who are in the housing space, you know, part of the challenge with affordable housing, um, even some at 80 percent, but especially the lower percent, as Margarita noted, are uh, is a is a that the mark the naturally occurring market does not na- naturally produce housing for folks at fifty percent AMI or sixty percent AMI. That's part of the reason that the state and the federal government put subsidies in place for that. But much deeper subsidies are needed for those at the lower end. But those needs assessments, which is something you all have talked about, including in a more intentional way in the con plan or um, in in an alternative document, 
Um, the ones that we've had recently show that that's where the greatest need is, that a lot of the subsidies that we have in the state either are, are required to be used for the sort of 60 to 80% or 80% to 100% range, or that's where they're being used because we can produce more units um, at, that, at that level when we use less subsidy. Um, but the needs assessments routinely show that Connecticut has a, has a great need for units at the 50% area median income and below, that that's where the deepest need is. I think the where is a different question, and that's something that we can um, talk about right now. Those folks mostly live in our urban centers because that's where, you know, nearly a half of our affordable units, our deed restricted units are, and those people necessarily have to live in deed restricted units because they can't afford, even by stretching their income, something higher. So the where we produce that housing is, a, I think, a later question. But to your point, Margarita, one of the questions I think that this group has brought up a couple times is the centrality of needs assessment in any sort of state housing policy document and really yeah. pointing out that lower need because not only does that involve the planning side, but it also involves the funding side. That's something the state will have to fund differently if they want to meet that need or direct existing subsidies in a way that really targets financing those lower, um, those ex what we call ELI, those extremely low income units. Um, and, and there are some resources, some tool funding streams that can do that, and there are others that, that can't. Um, and so that's, that's something that I think would be necessary to be considered as part of a larger overarching policy document. There was a needs assessment that was part of the state long range housing plan, which many of you saw. And it looked like, for those of you who aren't aware, the Department of Housing didn't exist when this plan was originally put in place. DOH was part of DECD and then split off. And I'm not sure if that's why this um, plan was no longer produced, but um, it looks to me based on reading the document that both the Department of Housing and the Connecticut Finance Housing Authority got together to do a needs assessment as part of this project every five years. And that included something called an, a review of the institutional structure. Um, or resources available. It sounds a little bit like an asset mapping um, kind of project, if you will. But this joint needs assessment um, and market analysis, I was that still occurs. I know that both agencies have produced needs analysis, but whether coming together in five years to produce one big needs analysis that then directed funding for both of those groups along with the con plan would be helpful. Um, but I don't, since Mike's not here, I can't answer that question. Um, Anika. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I think um, uh, Margarita and Kylie have brought us to a point where maybe we can start putting pen to paper. So one, I would make a proposal, which is that we put a pin in the question of whether we think we're making recommendations regarding the comp plan or whether we're suggesting that the state do a new plan. It may turn out that we're agnostic about that and what we're more concerned about is the prop is the substance as opposed to where it goes. Right. Um, and then I too, I think Margarita, maybe to put your mind at ease, I mean, given what we're, what our purview is we don't need to know the answers to these questions we're mostly just directing the state to find out answers like to answer certain questions so right, right. um uh and i think we can start defining the bucket so you kind of pointed to one already right which is to think differently to think separately the way i talk about it is um there is a segment of the population um of the country of the state of any given locality um whose income will never be able to afford the rent on a unit that meets the building code, right? Like just by function of having a building code, we set a minimum standard for housing and that's gonna cost a minimum number of dollars per month, whether you rent it or own it. And some people, that number is gonna be more than a third of their income, no matter what. And that's the universe of people who require a rental subsidy or to live in a subsidized unit. That's, there's no way around it whether because they're elderly or disabled or simply not able to work for whatever reason, or they pay, work a job that just is not going to pay a wage that allows you to um, inhabit a code compliant unit. And then you've got another increment of people for whom the, um, it's not because of the minimum standard by the building code, it's because of um, other things. And a lot of that is local land use restrictions. Um, where for whatever reason, the market's not providing a unit that is affordable to those people. That second bucket, that like the fact that the state subsidizes 
units at 80% of AMI, which is, should be mind blowing to everybody, is a, new, is a relatively new problem. It's one that's arisen in the 40 years since exclusionary zoning has taken over the coastal United States and run rampant. Um, that's a regulatory, that's a, that is a problem of overregulation. Um, and whether or not we agree on that, I suppose, I see Kirk shaking his head based on, I don't know, something he breathed yesterday, not something he's read, but nevertheless, um, uh, then we, um, we can at least think about those as two separate buckets of problems, right? Um, and direct the state to worry about both of them. Um, the, a third problem I heard you raise is just um, housing quality standards, um, housing code compliance. Um, uh, and right now the state doesn't do anything on that. It relies on local governments to basically enforce housing codes and building codes and local governments vary greatly in terms of their um, fiscal capacity to do that well and to hire enough code inspectors to do that and the places that have the oldest housing stock are also the places that have the least fiscal capacity. So that's bad. Like <laughs> it may be yeah. if the state were to put some effort into thinking about that problem, we could think about solutions differently than what exists today. Some mm -hmm. towns don't have capacity to do that at all because they don't even have a, they have a regional health district or something, right? So um, in my part of the state, you know, Hamden can't, the Camden relies on a regional health district to enforce the housing code. Um, you know, that's a problem. That may be a problem in and of itself, or maybe it's not. Maybe there's a way around it. I don't know. But um, not many people are thinking that hard about this stuff. So if we can maybe come up with the categories of things that we want the state to think about, then that might be a way to start putting pen to paper, Al Kylie, on our final product. And I'm happy to. And so what you said, what you're saying is we need to think about deep affordability, mm -hmm. but we also need to think about the 80% AMI and potentially a different vehicle for addressing it because it is a, a, a middle income area where that might drive your economic development. Is it Robert, who's the, the economic development guy? Um, yeah. So that might drive your economic development because those are the people who come for the good jobs, maybe the that boost the state. So you want to you want to foment that so you do have to address it. Um, if I could just- Go if ahead, I could, sir, you're the expert. Yeah, no, I'll I mute. could just share something that, um, and I don't know how this fits into the discussion, but here at Groton, we have an issue with Bramford Manor, which is a big uh, uh, HUD 400 unit place. And we, you know everybody is scrambling here to figure out how um, oversight kind of fell through the cracks. The tenants have been dealing with mold issues and subpar conditions for a long time. And the city and the town were involved in discussions with them and it's it's run by HUD. So the, the, the community in general is frustrated because it, there's so many layers of bureaucracy here, you know, no one's taking responsibility and it, it leaves the impression that dealing, discussing affordable housing issues in your community is gonna create more of these buckets that there's no accountability and people aren't taken care of. Up. So it's, it's a really a problem that I think needs to be discussed when we're talking about uh, making recommendations moving forward. Because when we improve the perceptions that these, uh, that the, these efforts lead to housing stock that has oversight, that people are treated with dignity and respect, you know, that, you know, just because you don't have, you know, the financial means to to um, pay the entire rent, and you're 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 relying on subsidies for that, doesn't mean you you should be treated any less than someone who pays that completely. And and that is the case, you know. And there's it's a very difficult issue. I, I'm, I understand there's a lot of complexities to it, but the, when when that when the, when that is addressed, I think you you will. Uh, it's it's important to people being enrolled in dealing with this issue locally. It's just, it's one of those things that the perception is that when the federal government's involved and the state on this stuff, it's just, the ball gets dropped, people are treated poorly and no one knows, you know, you have uh, election cycles, people move in and out of, of, of town governments, city governments, and, you know, there's no accountability. And, and it doesn't seem like it's solvable. So it would seem like somewhere in this kind of, in this report, in this discussion needs to figure out how, you know, there's a reliable kind of uh, way to address those issues. You know, the Brentford Manor situation is terrible. And, you know, it's public and I think there's going to be more discussion 
in the news about it. And it's, uh, you know, it, it really Im impacts the, the way to get people to address the, ha the housing crisis because it, it just creates a negative impression and it's a terrible conditions for people. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Robert. And I know the sort of affordable housing perception issues are a challenge in the, I think in my experience overseeing a housing code compliance department and a zoning department and having worked in the space most of the affordable housing that I've seen developed, especially the stuff that's newer, is actually most often better quality than the um, than the free market stuff that we that were that I think Margarita is talking about, and I've heard Anika talk about, which is you know sometimes referred to as NOAA, but is really oftentimes poor quality unit that doesn't have a lot of oversight. I know the city of Hartford. Um, when I was there, we worked on a housing code and they recently just passed a new housing code, which has more proactive uh, monitoring and compliance requirements, whereas previously that looks a little more like what um, New Haven has and Will can speak to that too. But I think there's um, uh, the challenge I see, Robert, from a, a higher level, you do have HUD oversight and of some of these housing quality issues, which sort of falls in our con plan bucket, right? Um, and as you've seen, there's been a real mixed bag, and that was true in Hartford too, on the quality of those inspections, the frequency of those inspections, the reality of those inspections. And at the municipal level, in my experience, there's simply not enough, there's not enough dollars and revenue in the cities that have the highest housing quality issues and the, the, the number of multifamily units that need inspection to cover those inspections in a meaningful way, in a way that's anything other than a reactionary in an occasional way, because housing code inspectors cost money, right? So I think part of the challenge is, do we need a, you know, a consistent statewide housing code? Is there a better way to state can fund housing code and compliance and support municipalities in that effort or create a different scheme for that? But I, I agree. I think that's a bucket that would be wise to include in this. And one of the other points I'll make, you know, as, as we know, you know, if there's, if there's problems in districts that have uh, plenty of wealth, you know, they, they, they find resources, they can hire attorneys, they can have their voices heard in areas like Brantford Manor. They really rely on, you know, the local town council, uh, right. the elected right. officials to step in. And sometimes, you know, um, that, that, you know, that doesn't happen, doesn't happen. and, yep. and, and then their voices go unheard. So it's, it's yep. a, it's a serious problem, uh, yep. that it's just a gap that needs to get filled there because, yep. you know, no, I agree. Um, I want to pause for a moment for a um, sort of procedural um, point that Anika put on the table so we can clarify the path forward before we continue talking about buckets. So um, Anika's, so there's a couple different pathways. One, we talked about just continuing with focusing on the con plan as the vehicle for state housing policy design. Two is to move in a different direction, something that looks like the old state long range housing plan. Three was to make recommendations for what we felt should be um, included components of a state policy document and allow the state to determine whether it makes sense to group that into the con plan or to set it up as a separate document. But that our task here, as we see it, would really be to identify those elements that the state should be considering in a every five year, let's call it, um, housing policy or housing plan document with some actionable steps. So do folks, is there any disagreement with the proposal Anika put on the table to focus on the substance of our buckets and note that either creating a separate document or morphing those in with the consolidated plan would be an acceptable outcome? Does anybody have any questions or concerns with that? Okay. Um, can, I just, can I just amend that though? Briefly? I'm not saying we yes. won't have an opinion about where it goes. I'm just yeah. saying we don't need one right now. And we'll it might start with the like we might say, yeah, we might say, oh, this could go in the con plan or this. I don't know. I just I feel like we can turn okay. to that towards the end. Understood. Marguerite, did you have a question on that before I move on? Yeah, to just um, I don't know how to, it, I would just say I'm completely agnostic, as Anika said, but the easiest path through the state would be all I would suggest. What is going to run into the least amount of bureaucracy and complication? If we stick with a con plan, does that work faster and more efficiently? That's all. You don't want, again, a lot of people opened this meeting saying they wanted to see concrete results. And one of them is to not get caught up in a morass of, oh, now we got to start a new plan. That's all. Yep. Got it. Um, un understood. Um, before I get to Matt, we've, we've had a, Anika and all of you have noted a couple of buckets, and then we have some other 
proposed focus areas we identified last time. So what I want to do is continue this conversation, but basically combine those into one list that we can circulate prior to our next meeting for a conversation. Go ahead, Matt. I'll do my best to do that. Yeah, so um, you actually clarified part of what I was going to ask, but I, my understanding of our role here is to try and determine what can be improved upon or changed or revised with the existing con plan in order to better suit housing needs of the state or to better suit Connecticut in some, some fashion here. Um, and I'm wondering if we're not, I mean, the, the housing policy discussion is great, but I'm wondering if we're not maybe stretching the scope of what we're going to be able to accomplish under our, our initial charge here. Um, yeah. you, you know, th th there's always an interesting, I, I'm not a housing expert by any stretch, but I always learn something new and, and we certainly have some differing opinions and it's good to hear from both sides. Um, and as much as I enjoy that conversation, I'm not sure we're going to be able to impact things to the extent that this conversation has gone using the existing con plan. But I believe our charge is to work within the existing confines of that plan. And as we've noted in this meeting and previous meetings, the con plan is essentially a spending plan. We are our five buckets of funding we get from the federal government and they require us to tell them how we're going to spend it. Um, so I, I, I want to, you know, think clearly and make sure that we're actually going to accomplish our charge and what we're doing. And if we can push the bounds of that, then so be it. We have to make sure that, you know, we, we satisfy that core goal. Um, and then the other thing I just want to throw as far as buckets go, we have the con plan, but we also have the annual action plan. And, and we've all talked a lot about, you know, how do we get to that finer grain of detail? You know, what is the plan? A plan is something that should tell you what your next steps are. Um, and I think we would be remiss if we didn't include the action plan as maybe the vehicle for taking on some of the things that we're talking about. Um, and it would be nice if, you know, Michael were here because he could tell us, but like we've established, the con plan is pretty structured in what it needs to include. I think there's a little more wiggle room with the annual action plans that come out of it. So that's just my two cents. That's valuable and helpful, um, Matt. I think one of the things I'm going to share my screen, I think. So we started our conversation by looking at the con plan and then all of you provided some recommendations on ways that you could um, that you saw to beef up or improve on the con plan. In other words, either things you thought should be taken into consideration as part of that plan that maybe weren't or components you felt would be valuable to add to that plan. Um, so I'm going to share those again with you on the screen because I think that'd be helpful for framing the conversation. And I think to Anika's point, those things could be in the con plan, Matt, because we've already looked at the con plan and decided, hey, these are some things that we feel like are missing that would make it better. I think what we're saying is, to your point, maybe they belong, some of them belong more in a different document, like an action plan, and others may be more appropriate for the con plan. And we could kind of get to that as we work through the recommendations that we have, but point noted that there's um, a, a limit, right, to what the con plan really encompasses. Um, and the, but the, there's also a broad charge here, right, which doesn't necessarily limit us from going beyond the immediate confines of that document. But I think most of the things we've talked about would fit within that anyway. Um, so I'm going to share my um, thing again with you guys so you can see where we were. Uh, all right. So these were the proposed focus areas that you all came up with after our between our first and second meeting that we reviewed and Bucky did in our last meeting. One was incorporating housing needs assessments, um, which is again something that we've talked quite a bit about here that Marguerite talked about and Nika did as well, that identifying needs both at an income level and in other ways would be um, particularly helpful and useful for either the confines of the con plan or something broader. Uh, two is tailoring the con plan to communities, recognizing where there's differences or opportunities in individual communities. And is there a way to better incorporate um, policy recommendations or direction for the con plan or otherwise um, that acknowledges that and again, identifies opportunities. Three was rehabilitation preservation, um, rehabilitation and preservation focus and incentives, noting that one of the areas that the con plan could take a better look at is how to best rehab and preserve existing affordable housing. And maybe this is where some of our housing quality um, and our housing um, code inspection issues could sort of fall under um, neatly or not. So as we may decide to create a separate category. Four was expanding evaluation of prior performance. So 
several of you noted after reading the plan that it would be helpful if more, there was a larger section of the con plan that really evaluated the outcomes of the prior um, expenditures and how that, um, how that panned out. Did it fully fall in line with the last con plan? Have there been shifts or changes that, were, that occurred in the meantime that um, otherwise made those directives less functional? So those are all things that we could look at there. And again, that's that number four bucket is something that could be specifically applied to just the elements of the con plan, or we could suggest to the state, hey, you should include a better, a more expansive evaluation of prior performance for the con plan. And we would encourage you to do something similar for state housing funding streams. And then the last was housing planning beyond funding implementation. So this gets into Matt's question a little more where we're talking about whether the con plan, which again, just directs these funding streams, these very specific funding streams is sufficient or whether the con plan could be used as a vehicle to discuss housing planning more broadly. That's where we really got into the conversation about the state long range housing plan um, and whether it was a wise idea to have a different document that did that or whether again, the con plan was the appropriate place to really talk about state housing planning more generally. And that would go beyond the five funding streams to talk about other federal federal funding streams as well as state funding streams that come through TOH and Chaffa. Are there any questions on these or anything folks wanted to add to these? I've also heard today we've talked about we talked about needs assessment again, which falls within bucket number one. We also talked about identifying market gaps, which could be part of the needs assessment um, bucket as well. We could include that under that. Um, Housing code compliance and housing quality, again, is that a conversation that's relevant in this rehabilitation and pre preservation thing? It may or may not be tied to those five funding streams, though. That would be a broader, um, that would be a broader topic, although some of those different HUD funding streams that the con plan applies to can be used for preservation and rehabilitation. So something to consider there. Um, and then we mentioned the advance the um the action plan and whether there could be some, um, whether that's something else we should review or consider as it's related to this document and perhaps the old slurp as I called it. Uh, any, other, any other thoughts or questions on these? We can continue our conversation about um, buckets noting we only have um, 25 minutes left. So I wanted to pause, see if we've missed anything um, and also maybe talk for a few minutes about how we want to proceed from this point forward. Any questions or thoughts on those? I think those, one, I think, those, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, mine will be quick, Kirk, I, I promise. Um, have we thought about how the, I don't want to call it top down, but a lot of this planning happens at a state level and there are other interest groups and everything that, that kind of lend their voices to it. But like with the state plan of conservation, it's supposed to be the state plan has these broad overarching goals and then local communities develop their own plans and those get filtered up through the regions and there's kind of a mashup that's supposed to yeah. occur. Whether or not that actually happens is yet to be determined here. Um, but have we talked about how local plans might influence what comes out of the comp plan or what gets included in the comp plan and what bucket that might fit in? Yeah, um, whether these new AHPs, in other words, you're saying, um, I think there's a broader question of like, right, should we have a big state state housing policy document that says, this is our overarching thing and the con plan should follow this and it helps give guidance for the state plans and state plans feed into that and the action plan comes out of that. Or whether, again, maybe what you're suggesting is that the con plan should take into account some of the AHP ideas, actions, proposals that come out of those 160 or as it were now, maybe 80 um, affordable housing plans. So are you suggesting more that the AHP should be mashed up more with the con plan or that it would be best to have one document that kind of incorporates all of those? Well, I, I, I think I, for me personally, I think there has to be some consideration of local needs and desires wrapped into the con plan. Now, where that lands can be a sliding scale, um, but I think if you just have a state-driven process or a town-driven process and you live and die by those rules, we're never going to gain ground, whatever gaining ground might look for you or your community. Um, I think there needs to be at least discussion about how those ideas are brought together and discussed and debated and included or not included in the rationale why. Otherwise, you're just gonna argue for life. 
Yeah. So maybe that AHP is an element under the bucket we had where state, considering the differences of local communities in the state con plan. And we had talked about things like infrastructure and sewerage and how better to apply HUD funds to rural communities as well as urban and suburban communities that may be incorporating the AHP elements as part of that bucket would make sense. I, I think so. And I think that's that would be a good focus of this group is not necessarily to decide uh, what weight is given or what policies ultimately end up in the wash, but how that process is defined that allows for all those voices to have a say in what ultimately becomes, you know, the, 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 the spending plan for the state. Um, and, and I think this group here could help develop that process to make sure all the voices are heard and, and appropriately discussed and deliberated. Gotcha. Kirk, you were, had wanted to jump in there. Right. I just wanted to say, I think I agree completely with the list. I probably put uh, former performance first, because I think it pre presents a foundation on yeah. which to grow. But otherwise, I think the list is a good list. And um, I, I think if you follow that, uh, you'll have a better plan. Okay. Kylie, I don't know if it's worth an addition, but the um, one requirement of the con plan and the federal regulations is that you have to certify that you're affirmatively furthering for housing. And I wonder mm. if we ought to put that on there as well. Yeah, it's also, um, uh, furthering fair housing is a required component of state law and multiple federal fa housing sources, um, housing funding streams as well. So it's an important element to include if for no other reason, I think, than to make sure it's consistently tied in and applied. I'm guessing that and without looking at the federal requirements that it's got to be a part of con plan requirements, but I would have to go back and look at that again. Oh, yeah, no, it's 24 CFR 91.325. Okay. Yes, it's in there. Thank you, Thank you Professor. Yeah. <laughs> any other questions or thoughts on those buckets that we put and I think like we said some of these things some of our new questions and comments today sort of seem to fall neatly within those which is good Margarita see your hand up oh you, you guys touched on on the infrastructure how would you roll in the infrastructure consideration uh, again I turned it I delved into that too so I'm curious to hear what you say yeah um, I'm going back to the slide where we, um, and don't you, did you have it in your email? I'm sorry. No, no. I, I'm looking at what we had in there for it. Sorry. Oops. Sorry. Backwards. Expand prior performance rehab Taylor planning. So how could the con plan, this is the original, uh -huh. in the, my mashup of the comments I received, how could the con plan create guidance for achieving more affordable housing in rural, suburban, and urban communities to better, more effectively support development outcomes as different towns have different development challenges. Um, I, AHPs were included in here. The state opportunity map was another potential consideration here. Housing and racial segregation study, which is coming out of OPM, um, as tools to better target resources um, and avoid further concentrations of poverty and segregation. So again, this um, the element of this was to try to tailor or at least acknowledge and create, um, build in some component that, that talks with or talks to or deals with the fact that different towns have different infrastructure resources as well as needs and that where housing is built is sometimes dependent on those things and perhaps funding um, streams can be better targeted to support towns that need infrastructure support in order to get more affordable housing. Okay. Built. Good. Um, I can try to flesh some of these out a little bit more too. In fact, um, so I'm gonna stop sharing and just talk quickly about next, um, next steps. So what I am hearing from all of you is that we, we seem to have a good areas of focus that we identified with the original con plan that seemed to make sense with proceeding with and then we've identified some additional nuances and factors that would be helpful to build into those um, and that perhaps we can have further discussion on where those were best incorporated, whether these are direct con plan recommendations to Matt's comments so that we stay more strictly within our guidelines or whether we create flexibility or other suggestions to the state. There's nothing saying we couldn't say, hey, here's some con plan recommendations. And also we think this should be considered as a separate thing. So we could do that too. But so what I'm hearing is that we kind of have these buckets. They seem to be about good for right now and that further discussion might be warranted on how, how best to apply those. Does that make sense to everyone before I chat about next steps? Okay. 
So what I'm going to propose, and I will, I will take a first stab at this, and I'll use, um, I'll use my uh, amazing senior policy analyst Haley to help with this, is to take those buckets, try to flesh them into something that looks more like the beginning draft or framework of some recommendations that we can share with you all. I'm going to do my best to try to get something together in advance of our next meeting, which is coming up relatively quickly. It's only, I think, two weeks away on, on um, July 12th, and I'll share that slide with you in a second. Um, but I will do my best to do that in a timely fashion. Um, does that is that work for all of you? And then we can you can all reflect on that, and we can have some further conversation at the next meeting, and then perhaps use our time between July and September to um, for you to share additional red lines or comments with me via email. Okay. I will, let me, I'm sharing my screen with you again, only to make sure I didn't miss anything here before we finalize our time together. All right, thanks for bearing with me without having Mike here. Hopefully uh, DOH will be able to join us again next time and we can talk a little bit more about the various um, vehicles for providing some of this. Um, so your homework is, if I'm able to get something done quickly, to review whatever draft I send in advance of the next meeting. If I'm not able to send it more than a day or two in advance, then we can use some of our time during the next session to walk through that and see if it makes sense to all of you and maybe make some initial tweaks together. And then again, after that, between July and September, for you to share with me any red lines or sort of real red flags you want to add to that. Our, future, our next meeting is Thursday, July 12th um, at the same time. We had no meeting scheduled in August uh, originally, and that's in part because usually I find that it's quite difficult to, with vacation schedules, to get a critical mass of folks. If we get through our meeting in July and decide it would be really helpful to have further discussion or to have some small group conversation, I'm totally um, fine with that as well. Um, I will talk with our folks, Ashley and Will, about which September dates we had, if any, identified through the doodle poll, and I'll share those um, with you at the next meeting, um, and we can identify whether we'll need additional time as the um, fall wears on, but I, I think we're moving in a good direction. Does anybody have any other questions or comments? How do folks feel about this sort of group facilitation style? Is there anything else you would like to try in terms of incorporating input in a way that you feel would be better? Just asking for future meetings. Okay. I'll take your silence as complimentary to my meeting facilitation style. Um, and hopefully um, we'll have Rep Williams able to um, join us uh, next time as well, again, as um, some more support from my end. So thank you for bearing with me through um, my technical snafus today. All right, I really appreciate everyone's time. Thank you for your candor and thanks for sharing your ideas. I felt like we had a pretty productive conversation. I will uh, share my document with you as soon as I'm able to get something drafted. And if you have other questions or comments in the meantime, or you think of some comment or bucket that we didn't talk about today that you feel is relevant, please feel free to send it along to me via email. I'm Kylie at pschousing.org and I will do my best to incorporate that for conversation next time. All right, so you'll get a wrap up email after this um, from our awesome staff who will assist in sending out meeting links again in advance of the next meeting. So feel free to reach out to Ashley or Will if you have any questions on that end too. Otherwise, I will give you back a few 13 minutes of your afternoon and wish you all a good evening. Thanks, everyone.